I will read the book. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is a regular meeting of the Community Resource Committee of the Town Council. It is June 25. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of mem members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I would like to call the meeting to, to I would like to hear from everyone if they can be heard. My, my dinner just got delivered, excuse me. Um, uh, let's start with Pat DeAngelis. Can Present. you hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Councillor Taub. Present. And Pam Rooney is present. And we have with us three candidates for the planning board, which we will be addressing tonight. So our agenda is, is that we will um, go through the uh, interview questions. And in the process of each of the questions, uh, we will rotate who begins the, re the reply and make our way through the seven or eight questions. And, um, and then we will um, thank you all. And, and then we will deliberate. So we will be making our recommendation, which will get voted on um, at the council on July 15. So it's not tomorrow, but it's, uh, it's relatively soon. So before we start, I want to express my appreciation for the fact that you are all interested and uh, and willing to serve on a committee in the town. Jennifer, do you want to do you want to explain the questions and just the order that will go in? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I hope that you each receive the email. Um, and there's eight questions, and so we're rotating in alphabetical order. Counts, um, counselors on CRC asking the questions, and then we're rotating the order of responses. So everybody's not going first, second, or third. So uh, perhaps when the person, the counselor asked the question, they you could indicate the order in which we're um, requesting the responses. Mm -hmm. So with that, I guess Pat DeAngelis comes first in the alphabet. So <laughs> you have the first question. Just a point Welcome. of order. Before yeah. Pat asks the question, who's timing? Uh, is that Pam or Jennifer timing the answers? And what is the amount of time they have to answer? Thank you. I am not timing, but um, two to three minutes per question should be very sufficient. Okay. I can time if that is helpful. You won't see it on the... Just wave it when it gets yeah. close. So are we saying two or three minutes? I'll say max three minutes. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, the first question, uh, and I'm going to be asking Melissa first and then Lawrence. And Lawrence, is it Lawrence or Larry? Or what it's would Lawrence. you like? I'm sorry, what? L uh, Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. And Doug. Um, and um, so I'm going to start. What might you bring to the planning board that can make it successful? Please include any experience you have appearing be before or serving on the planning board or ZBA or watching meetings of the planning board or ZBA. And we'll start with Melissa. Hi. So um, I've never served on the planning board or the ZBA. I have attended um, a few meetings of both of them and also the LHDC um, in uh, uh, as a part of a review of some um, developments that were uh, happening in the neighborhood that I live in. Um, and I, I just thought it was really fascinating. Um, and because of it, I sat down and read a bunch of the zoning laws in Amherst and learned about the master plan. Um, and uh, I think what I would bring to the table is I'm a very uh, organized person. I've um, I've been the creative director of two different publishing houses. So I have a background in design and um, 
I uh, have sort of revamped the systems of both of these publishing houses, created design standards for both of them, um, been the brand cop for National Geographic and Barnes and Noble. So I'm, I'm kind of familiar with, um, with uh, you know, having certain uh, regulations and uh, making sure that they are properly communicated to the interested parties um, and also creating consensus between groups that might have, you know, very different opinions, but um, might, you know, all have valid points of concern. Um, the other thing is I uh, have lived, I grew up in Amherst and in Northampton. My father was a professor at UMass for about 30 years. I am a you know, old, but currently enrolled UMass undergrad because I never finished. So um, I'm I'm betting I'm the only UMass undergrad who owns their home, um, who is uh, a local, but who has spent the last um, 30 years, 35 years living in big cities on the <laughs> application team. So I kind of have a weird, but I think unique perspective. Thank you, Melissa. And I want to say that I graduated from Smith College at the age of 50, so we all finish things in different times. Ada Comstock? Yes. Nice. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Lawrence, you want to take it away on this first question? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so I, I just want to start by saying I'm I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to um, to interview for this important role. Um, so I'm I'm a, a new transplant to Amherst. I moved uh, here with my wife and daughter um, uh, about a year and a half ago. We moved in April of of 2023, and we came from um, Durham, North Carolina, which is in uh, the Research Triangle. Um, and what 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 draws me to this work um, and and the work of the planning board um, is that in Durham we we really saw firsthand how a community facing opportunities and challenges can. Uh, through smart planning and sustainable development, um, really just become a better place to live, become healthier and and more vibrant. Um, Durham, where Duke University is located, is also a, a really extraordinary example of what town gown collaboration can look like when it's really successful. Mm. Um, and and living there and experiencing that, and I also worked at Duke University when I was there, um, really helped me understand how how decisions that are seeded through that kind of collaboration and purposeful leadership, um, they may take decades to come fully into bloom, but they can they can make a real difference in, in people's lives. Um, so when I moved to Amherst, uh, uh, I, I was really drawn in, in um, finding a way that I could get involved in town government and, and thinking about um, the future of, of the town. Um, my wife and I chose Amherst because we were really drawn to the wonderful character of the place. Um, but we also see a lot of opportunities for it to become more vibrant, more inclusive, more sustainable. Um, so I, I really care about the future of this place for my daughter and my family. And um, I would be I'd be really honored to get involved in, in the important work of the planning board. Um, I'm also uh, if if um, uh, the board decides to go in a different direction, um, seeking other opportunities to get involved in town government. Um, uh, I had an interview for the, the conservation committee. Um, so I'm really committed to doing this work in, in some way, whether I'm I'm uh, chosen for the board or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And Mr. Marshall, Doug, take it away. You're muted, Doug. You're muted. Thank you. There we go. Uh, thank you, Pat, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, so I think I bring skills in pretty much four areas. One is as a, a registered architect and, and planner, I am familiar with working with uh, architectural plans and site plans and interpreting them and envisioning what they would be like in the real world once executed. Um, I think I'm also relatively uh, capable of expressing my opinion in an articulate way about spatial uh, potential changes. Um, second of all, uh, I have been on the planning board for the last four years. Um, so I'm already familiar with uh, its practices and the various regulations and bylaws that it uh, concerns itself with. Um, uh, I would, since I, as a continuing member, I would be able to 
vote on any matters that are sort of in process when my term, when this current term ended, uh, rather than having to sit out uh, until new uh, topics came on to the agenda. Uh, I'm also a 14-year uh, resident of the town. And uh, I, so having uh, a child come through these schools and uh, working at UMass and being a resident of the town, I think I have a pretty good sense of the issues that people care about and um, the challenges that we face and the opportunities. And then uh, finally, I think I'm a relatively level-headed, uh, fair person and not uh, prone to uh, outbursts or uh, being highly offensive. And uh, I think that that characteristic is important at a, at a place like the planning board where people do get uh, uh, emotional and uh, you know worked up about how things might change or whether they should change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. And I'm going to pass it to Councilor Ate. Thank you, Pat. So question number two, the order of responses will be from Lawrence and then Doug and finally Melissa. The question is, Tell us about an experience you have had collaborating with a group, particularly where opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. Well, thank you for the question. I um, So my, my work experience uh, and background um, uh, is in strategic planning and, and leadership communications. Uh, I worked in national politics for um, about a decade, and I've spent um, the last close to a decade in um, in higher ed, uh, um, and I, I now work here at um, at at the college, um, and and that work um, requires a significant amount of consensus building across groups and and across constituencies, um, whose opinions are are almost always in conflict, um, and. You know, I think what real leadership looks like is the recognition that, you know, often neither side is satisfied with the decision that's made, but you're almost always better off when you can point to shared and and um, consistent principles, uh, and and demonstrate that you've made an effort to consider um, input from from stakeholders. So I've worked on on dozens of very controversial issues, um, uh, both in in my work in politics and. Um, uh, now in higher education, which um, I'm sure we all know is as controversial as it's ever been. Um, I could give you some specific examples from the past week, but um, uh, <laughs> I won't. Um, but uh, really what I've learned is that, um, you know, group dynamics can be really challenging. Um, as as Doug noted, um, the the planning board uh, is is particularly a space where, where people bring um, uh, strong emotions. Um, but I, I really enjoy engaging with people respectfully and, and open-mindedly to, to try to find a path forward on these on these really sticky issues. That's been the the work that I've done throughout my career, and it's it's really satisfying work for me. So I'm I'm really excited about the possibility of of joining the board and, and getting to do that work on behalf of the town. I believe Doug is number two. Okay, I guess I will go ahead. Just for the reminder. <laughs> um, well, I, I think at this point, my uh, when I was before you four years ago or three years ago, uh, uh, I had a couple of other examples, but uh, I think at this point, the planning board itself is pretty much my best example. Uh, <laughs> uh, and. Um, you know, the there have been a number of controversial uh, proposals before the board, and a couple of pro projects that were controversial. Um, in many that had uh, a lot of public comment, that uh, I think we all listened to pretty respectfully, 
and um, took into consideration when we, as we heard it. Um, I guess uh, within the board, there's very rarely been a unit unanimous uh, opinion about things. Uh, we have had a good diversity of opinion. And, um, you know, uh, I guess I've been the chair, I think, for the last year and a half, maybe two years. And throughout that, I've tried to be uh, equally, you know, equally respectful of everybody, regardless of whether I uh, uh, agreed with them or not and um, give everybody whatever time they need to say their piece, not try to cut anybody off. And um, generally, uh, I think we have, have ended up with decent uh, results that not everybody was happy with. And most people may have been a little disappointed that they weren't perfect, but we have made slow, but I think steady progress toward uh, uh, and made good decisions in terms of the projects that came before us. Thank you. So um, I have spent the last 25 years in publishing. Every single decision that is made in publishing is made um, in conjunction with other groups, uh, design, editorial, authors, sales, marketing, distribution. Um, Ev everyone has a say uh, and everyone has an opinion. And in the creative team, our sort of specialty is to uh, parse those opinions into one representation of a book. Um, oftentimes it, it, you know, the controversy is, is small, it's within the, the publishing house, um, but you know, this is someone's life's work often, you know, the, the book, um, I was at National Geographic for 21 years and a, a huge number of the books that we published were published, you know, they were nonfiction, virtually academic um, treatises that, that people had spent their entire lives preparing to write and creating. And so their very deeply held beliefs about what their book should look like and how it should be presented to the, the greater world. Um, often did not jibe with those of the publisher or the sales team or you know the editor and it would be my job to bring everyone together and uh, as as you all say um, a lot of times everyone would not be completely thrilled with the decision we call it design by committee um, but it is a, it is a committee everyone brings a different voice and a different level of expertise to the table and that is um, true in publishing and it would be true in the planning board. There would be, you know, experts that you would want to listen to and that I would want to listen to. People whose, you know, homes might be affected by development, people who, kids who cannot find housing that they can afford, families that can't find homes that they can afford in Amherst. Those are all people that I would want to listen to. And I, I think that, you know, in terms of creating consensus, I got a, I got shelves of it, but not, not a lot of controversy. Thank you very much. Question three will be taken over by Councillor Haneke. Thank you. Um, the order of responses, I think you'll see a pattern here, will be Doug Marshall, then Melissa Ferris, and then Lawrence Klutz. Um, and the question is, please describe how the planning board can help achieve the goals of the master plan. Doug? All right. Uh, well, the master plan has a variety of, uh, of goals. Uh, I think they're called key directions, some of which are for change and uh, predominantly enhancing or building up our town centers and, uh, and, and, and in building up the downtown area. But at the same time, it's calling for keeping the uh, character of the town pretty much unchanged. And so character is a word that I suppose everybody has their own idea about, but I think uh, there is some tension there between change and the continuity of the character of the town. So um, the board is one venue in which that tension plays out. And uh, given the variety of people who get uh, appointed to the board, we always get a good number of perspectives and then we hear more from the public. But 
uh, we make uh, essentially a first pass at things, and then uh, the, the decision gets moved to whether it's this body or to town town council. Uh, and so it's it we're just one step along the path. Um, so that's sort of from a procedural point of view, we're, we're the beginning of the conversation. Um, now, specifically, the, town, the planning board can support CRC and the council uh, and the planning staff to the extent we can and try to uh, lend our opinions to whatever issues they're seeking our guidance on or recommendation. Um, we also provide a public forum for the public to uh, make comments about things that are being considered. It's not the only public, the only forum, but it's one of the one of the primary forums. Um, we can um, initiate zoning proposals to change the bylaws one way or the other. Uh, but again, that's a it's a first pass, and we work with staff to do that. Uh, but from there, it goes to CRC and to council. Finally, um, we try to keep in mind the, the master plan and our, at least how we interpret it and um, make sure that when we approve projects uh, or when we're thinking about new bylaws that what we're doing is consistent with that master plan. Uh, there hasn't been any discussion lately about doing a new master plan, although our current plan is about a dozen years old. Um, but at, if, if that happens sometime in the next few years, uh, a planning board would certainly be heavily involved in that. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, uh, sort of uh, following up on what Doug said, I, I sat down and read the master plan recently and I, I noticed that um, it, it is older. Some of the design review board stuff seems older. It, it seems like some of the demographic information isn't quite as up to date. And I think um, one of the ways that the, the planning board can really help focus on some of the larger issues that um, Amherst has, you know, in terms of maintaining a 12 month economy, um, in terms of help keeping families in Amherst, providing places for families to live, um, fast tracking permits for business development and appropriate infill, um, fast tracking, you know, uh, building reuse permits and waivers, um, things where we can sort of speed things along. And then, um, you know, as he said, we could suggest um, certain zoning bylaws that might help focus on creating affordable housing that might appeal to a larger mixed market. Um, and again, uh, I know that the, the demographic drop off in Amherst is, is pretty concerning the like, you know, 25 to 45 year old um, uh, demographic has dropped off like 45% in the last 10 or so years. And that is really impacting school enrollment and things that would draw people to a town like Amherst um, that would encourage, you know, people like Lawrence or myself to move here. And I think that the zoning board can be a first step in addressing some of those issues. Thank you, Lawrence. Yeah, I, and and I I want to echo what Doug and Melissa said. I think um uh, they've they've uh, laid this out pretty clearly. But I I um I want to say that I I understand the work of the planning board to clearly be vital to the the continued success of the master plan and the future success of the master plan. Um, and having this deliberative deliberate ah, deliberative body, as Doug was saying. Um, alongside the CRC, alongside the town council, alongside the ZBA, ensures that that decisions are made to to these sort of real time questions with their longer term impact in mind. Um, and I understand that that many of these questions um, uh, and and this jumped out at me reading the master plan um, really come down to questions of balance. How do we maintain the town's character as as Doug was saying, 
while also supporting a more vibrant downtown and, and more vibrant village centers? Um, how do we balance preservation with, with appropriate development? Um, how do we support increasing our housing stock while, while minimizing the, the environmental impact? Um, these, are, these are really difficult, somewhat existential questions um, uh, for the town to navigate. And um, knowing that there are no perfect answers there, I think the, the planning's, planning board's role is to, to draw on um, experience, to draw on, on sort of shared principles and, and bylaws, um, and really to take into account public input as well to make decisions that are going to be ultimately sustainable over the long term rather than just responsive to a, a short term or immediate need. Thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Pam Rooney. Thank you. Uh, this is question number four, and the order of response will be Melissa, then Lawrence, and then Doug. Uh, please describe the considerations and objective, objectives you'll use for considering proposed revisions to the zoning bylaws. Melissa. Hi. So I think that, um, I, I think Amherst needs to address its housing crisis. And I think that is first and, and foremost um, in uh, any consideration for the zoning bylaws. Um, I think on a project by project, you know, on a project basis, it would always be case by case. But in terms of uh, zoning moves, I think that whatever can be done to encourage building housing, be it single family housing or um, developments that appeals not just to students, but also to, to families um, would be vital to keeping Amherst population from declining further. Um, I think that, uh, you know, given that there is a demographic cliff coming and, and everyone knows this, we don't want to end up with a bunch of housing that is going to sit vacant when the population drops off um, at, the, at the colleges. So I think that when considering any bylaw changes, that has to be a major factor is will families, will this help increase keeping families and bringing families into the town. Um, and that that would be the, the main thing that I think I would want to focus on. I also, you know, I love what Amherst looks like. I chose Amherst to, to come back to after having been away for, you know, 35 years um, because I think it's such a beautiful place. I think that the green spaces are so wonderful. I think the downtown is really lovely, but I, I think it could be more and I think it could be more successful than it is. And, and I'm, I am fearful that there will be a decline in the town because so much of it is aimed, so much of Amherst is aimed directly at one single demographic. And I think we have to diversify. And I think the planning board, excuse me, can help with that. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence, you're next. Yeah, I I, uh, I want to say and, and echo one point. I think um, housing is 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 and will continue to be the foundational issue for the town. Um, uh, I I think I've experienced this firsthand recently moving here. Um, we had a very hard time finding a, a place to live. We wanted to be here in town. Um, and uh, it took several months before we were able to find somewhere that was that was sustainable for us to settle. Um, and and a lot of people are feeling that struggle. Um, and people are feeling that struggle across demographics. And and um, that's that needs to continue to be a major priority for for anyone who's involved in town government. So I, I just wanted to echo what what Melissa said there. Um, in terms of of zoning revisions, I I think the bar does have to be relatively high. Um, in, in the sense that, you know, the bylaws are, are comprehensive and, and they've evolved over the course of very many years. Um, so I do think that, that changes need to be well considered and, and, um, and justified, uh, at the same time, just as the, the town changes and the, and the needs and the expectations of, of the folks who live here or visit, uh, the, the town change, um, the bylaws can't be monolithic, um, so, so I think that the planning board, um, like the ZBA and and um, other bodies, uh, knowing that that we have a responsibility to to protect the the health, safety, convenience, and and general welfare of of Amherst residents and visitors, I think the first question with any revision that I would ask is: Is this revision going 
to support that goal. Is this revision going to help make Amherst healthier, safer, more convenient, or better off? And then the second question that I ask um, uh, would be, um, is this revision gonna help help the board and help other bodies better support the, the goals articulated in the master plan? Um, I think it's also important just from a process standpoint to consider whether there's a, a consistent source spot in the, in the planning or review process um, where either the, the ZBA or the planning board could um, clearly be doing their work more efficiently or, or more effectively. Um, so, so we should also consider um, those sorts of process challenges as well. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, and Doug. Yeah, thanks. Um, some of my, my uh, response has already been mentioned by uh, Lawrence and, and Melissa. Um, I, I, first of all, I would think that we'd want to consider whether it's consistent with the master plan, uh, at least one or more of the goals that are contained in the master plan. Um, I do agree with, uh, I think, both of them that, that housing has been a sore point in the last few years, uh, actually probably more like the last few decades. Um, but uh, commercial development is also uh, an issue particularly with some of the financial challenges we're having. So, um, you know, how can that, can that be encouraged or should we just consider that we're a, we're a college town and that's, that's what, what we do best. Um, I would be also, I would, I would take cues from the planning department and their, their opinions. Um, we're, we on the board are just thinking about this a few hours each week, whereas the planning department is living it pretty much uh, full time. Um, thirdly would be the public and how does the public feel about it? And, um, you know, it's hard to get a really broad cross section of public comment, at least it seems. Uh, we have some, some folks in town who are, are follow the planning board closely and are frequent commenters. Um, but I think one of the places we could be better uh, is trying to figure out how to get a, a wider selection of input from, from a, a more diverse group. Um, uh, next would be, is it, is it, a, is it under, an understandable change? Um, it, does it have a clear goal uh, that somebody who's not really paying attention could understand or read about it in the Gazette? Um, you know, if we're if we're spending our time on something that's kind of obscure and um, not really like perceived as productive, uh, I would have some concerns about that. And I guess the last thing is, uh, by doing the the change, whatever it is, are we imposing greater costs on the private sector? And is that a good thing, or is that a sector? you know, whatever part of the private sector that we want, that we're dealing with, um, you know, is that a good thing to increase costs of doing business in town or not? And uh, so those are the considerations that I would, that I would put forward. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna pass this over to uh, Jennifer, Councillor Taub. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was turning off the timer. You've all been great with your responses. <laughs> under three minutes. So uh, <clears throat> um, my question is, uh, what's your opinion of waivers, exceptions, and special permits in the zoning bylaw? When should uh, they be used and when should they not be used? And the order of responses would be Lawrence, Doug, and Melissa, and we'll start with Lawrence. So I, th I think the benefit of of having a a deliberative body that that has waivers, exceptions, and and special permits as as sort of a tool in its toolbox is that you know if there's a situation that that clearly with the consensus of the board, um, uh, you know a, a project clearly supports the goals of the master plan, but it's it's conflicting with or is is being unreasonably held up by a provision of the bylaws. That this is a tool that the that the board can use in limited cases. Um, that being said, I think it's it's um, uh, tricky, and and the board needs to be really careful not to be perceived as as playing favorites or um, moving controversial projects along. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, particularly when there's when there's um, uh, disagreement um, uh, in in the public about um, about the viability of them. Um, so again, I think the bar for waivers and and exceptions um, should be relatively high. Um, and again, I think if they're they're being requested or granted in a majority of cases, that that's actually probably evidence that we should consider a revision to the underlying bylaws. Um, all that being said, I, I, it's obviously more difficult to to change a bylaw than it is to grant a waiver, um, and and that's one of the reasons that the board exists, and that's why we have a well established process for considering these these individual cases in a in a deliberative and um, well reasoned way. Thank you, uh, Doug. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I can actually improve on that response. Uh, starting with the master plan and and how what's the sort of congruity between the master plan and uh, the bylaw and it does feel like the bylaw sort of has sort of lagged behind um, I, I know that or I've heard that when the master plan was done it was expected there would be a pretty significant rewrite of the bylaws after that and that that never happened so uh, I do feel like there are some areas in which uh, they lag. Um, so I would uh, I would also start with the master plan. And um, are we advancing the master plan by granting a waiver? Um, and um, as far as some of the others, uh, you know, I think it's on a case by case basis. And, but the sort of principle that I usually try to bring to the case by case is uh, what, what are the overall directions that the master plan is asking us to go? And, and where, how do we want, what direction do we want the, uh, um, the town to evolve in? Um, that said, we shouldn't be doing this arbitrarily. It should be, it should be something that we can explain, we can defend, um, you know, I, and then um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And Melissa. Um, uh, to piggyback on what Doug said, I don't think you can arbitrarily say a uh, waiver should always be used in this instance or it should never be used in this instance. I think the reason you have a planning board is so that you can review each of these on a case by case basis and make decisions about what is best for the town. Um, that being said, I, I think that there are areas knowing that Amherst has such a huge housing crisis um, where I would think that, you know, personally, I would feel more lenient, you know, more inclined to uh, grant them if, if, for instance, it's for a development that um, will serve a sort of broader demographic, um, a broader economic demographic with, with its building. Um, I think if, uh, you know, if, if we can, see that someone truly wants to build for low-income families, that is something that I think you would have to give special consideration for and think about, you know, yes, versus, you know, just a, a, a random type of development or location where you might want to green light all of them. Um, and I also think that, you know, special real consideration should be given to economic um to uh, environmentally fragile areas there's a you know there's a lot of um riparian you know edging in amherst and i would want to make sure that you know that kind of stuff is really carefully reviewed um for things like waivers and exceptions thank you uh and i will pass the baton to pat DeAngelis. Thank you. Uh, so this is a, an important one, and, and you've each touched on it a tiny bit already. What is your approach to incorporating public input into your decision making? And we're going to start uh, with uh, Doug and then move to Melissa and finally Lawrence. So Doug? Thanks, Pat. Um, so I had an actually a pretty short answer to that. Um, I tr first, I try to listen 
uh, attentively and respectfully to every public commenter who shows up. Um, for someone to take time from their busy life and figure out when our meetings are, find the Zoom link, and actually show up at the point in the meeting where we're asking for public comment or a comment on a specific project. Uh, you know, that takes some, some dedication. So I try to be respectful of that. Um, I also read all the public comments that come in. And generally, I try to keep my mind open so that I am able, so that I'm open to being persuaded by their opinion. And um, that's, that's really all I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. And <clears throat> And we'll go to Melissa. Yeah, I mean, these are these are our neighbors, right? And I think that what we want to do is create a welcoming environment for all input. I think people most directly impacted by any new developments or changes um, should have their voices heard and they should be strongly considered. Um, I think, you know, as as far as it goes, the planning board is here to hear from people. And I would, you know, I would absolutely incorporate public opinion into any decisions that I would make because Amherst is the public opinion. That's, we're the town. That's, that's, that's who should be speaking on these points. It, it's not just a, a, a random plan that, that we're looking at. It's people and their everyday lives that are being impacted by these developments. And I want to make sure that they are all represented in the final decisions that are made. Thank you. And we'll go to Lawrence. So I, I um, uh, agree with Doug and Melissa that um, public input is, is very important, um, uh, both to helping make the board decisions that will um, most benefit those who are, are directly impacted, um, uh, but also in fostering support and 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 trust in town government and the way that the town operates. Um, I think that the board should should take comments from the public into into equal consideration alongside um, commitments to the goals of the master plan, as we've been discussing, and um, uh, and the other resources that are provided through through presentations um, and site visits. Um, but but I do think that public opinion alone cannot dictate the board's work. Um, uh, in my previous position, um, working in politics, um, we heard a lot from from constituents, and uh, decisions were were um, often guided by um, opinions from constituents. Uh, but those decisions were ultimately based on on what was sound policy and um, on longer term considerations. Um, so. From my perspective, I guess I would say public input should be a very important contributing factor, um, but the board has to be able to make decisions that are subject to open debate and um, occasionally to make decisions that are um, unpopular. Thank you very much. And we'll move, I'm busy writing notes, I'm sorry, um, to question seven, Councilor Ette. Thank you. So the order for question seven will be first Melissa, then Lawrence, and finally Doug. The question is, what else would you like us to know about you that makes you a strong candidate for the planning board? I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure. There's much more that I can say that uh, would qualify me more. Um, the one thing I I did want to mention is that um, I do have experience reading architectural plans um, and site plans and elevations. Um, my husband is a sculptor, and I am his primary renderer, and we often work with site plans <laughs> uh, for his commissioned work. Um, so I am frequently, you know, figuring out where his piece will go and how how large it can be and where the electric conduits are so he doesn't kill himself installing it and things like that. So um, that's that's about it. Um, I, I do have to say, 
I, I think you have better candidates than me. Um, I think Lawrence and Doug are probably stronger candidates than I am. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Uh, but I, I also think that I do bring a kind of unique perspective to the table. Um, and, you know, I would be happy to do it. So I, I do want to be completely honest here. But I, I also think this, this is something that I, I would enjoy doing and I would bring a level of enthusiasm and a really almost upsettingly strong work ethic too. So there you go. So I think I'm next. And I would actually say I, I would lead with the same. Uh, uh, Melissa and Doug both clearly have so much more experience uh, uh, when it comes to um, the town of Amherst and um, uh, the intricacies of, of how these these processes work. So I, I um, uh, actually think that Doug and Melissa would both be very strong candidates. But um, the one thing that I do want to add is, is um, I, I, I just want to reiterate that that I care really deeply about this town. Um, uh, we chose to move here. Um, uh, we hope to be here for a really long time. And this is where they're, where we want to be to to raise our family. Um, I believe really strongly now more than ever in in the work of local government, which I think is is absolutely at the heart of our shared future. And um, I would just be really honored to serve um, the town, if not in this role, then hopefully in in some other capacity. Um, uh, just because I I care about this place, I know I'm I'm um, I'm new here, but uh, but I love it and I want to see the very best for it. So. Um, I would just thank you for your for your consideration. I guess I will uh, I will say a slightly different tack, which you've clearly got three good candidates tonight. <laughs> uh, and you know, I think it's really up to you how you want to want the board to evolve. Um, you know, I you you've seen me in planning board for the past couple of years. So I'm a known entity, and uh, so I don't have a whole lot new to to offer you, uh, other than my continued service. Um, and whereas Larry and Melissa will have a fresh set of eyes on whatever comes before the board. So uh, the only other thing I was going to say was I've enjoyed my time on the board, and I'd be happy to continue. And uh, and yes, I am willing to do the work in between the meetings. Thank you. Mandy. Thank you. Last one. This one's might be one of your easiest. Um, the order will be Doug, then Lawrence, then Melissa. Please confirm that you have the time to commit to meetings, hearings, and site visits. And if you currently serve on any town boards or committees, do you see any conflicts with serving on multiple boards? And can you manage the time commitment for all? So Doug. Uh, yes, I think that I can manage the time commitment. Uh, the only other board that I've been involved in lately has been the Community Preservation Act Committee, and that is because I was the liaison from the planning board. Uh, and I assume if I were not reappointed, that would end. Um, and that that those liaison assignments also rotate typically every year. And so, you know, for several years, I didn't have a liaison appointment. So. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, yes, I am. I am uh, uh, very willing to to put in the time and um, would be very excited to serve. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I also put in for um, uh, the uh, conservation commission, um, but I understand that process is is taking a little bit longer. So, um, uh, from my perspective, I don't think there would be a necessarily a conflict there. But um, planning board would be my my first priority and and my first choice if I were to be offered both. So, thank you, Melissa. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have time. Uh, and I'm not on any other boards, and uh, I would be happy to give my time to Amherst. Thank you. I'm going to pass it back to the chair. Pam? Great. Thank you, everybody. This, this, it always impresses me how informative this is, and it, it almost feels like a conversation, or at least to us it does, perhaps not to the people having to respond to questions. 
Um, we are going to, we are, you, you made it a difficult choice. This is, this is a, a, a good conversation. Um, we're going to ask you to join the audience and then we will, we will begin our deliberation. We hope to uh, make a decision um, tonight. And so if you're, if you're listening, you would probably get a good sense of, of um, whether we're going to recommend uh, each and any one of you to be voted on on July 15. And in any case, um, one of us will communicate with you what the decisions are tonight. If you if you choose not to hang around and listen and, and hear us chat about you. Do you want me to move everyone over now, Pam? That would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, everybody. Really appreciate you participating. Super. Thanks very much. I'm going to open the floor to comments. Pat. You, you coughed, you go first. <laughs> oh, heavens. I, I do think that we have three decent candidates. Um, I was worried about the, um, the sufficiency of the pool, but I think that we've been very lucky. Um, I'm... I'm not sure where where you want me to go. Do you want to say my top choices or things that I'm considering? I mean, I think um, a lot of what I want to consider is the whole idea of character of our town. Uh, and I think that it becomes critical for us to really deeply understand it and honor what needs to be preserved and be willing to change. Um, and those might be different places for different people, but I I, I felt like uh, that people made attempts to address that uh, as honestly as they could. Um, I'm also, you know, given that one of my first council experiences was what's now East Gables, I saw what public opinion did which was to try to end that project. And the abutters in that particular neighborhood um, did everything they could to defeat it. Um, and it is an amazing project. It fits in with the neighborhood. It, it provides housing, I think, for 28 individuals. Um, and some of those individuals are coming out of homelessness or drug addiction. Addiction. Many of them are hardworking people with full-time jobs, but the salary that they make. So I, I, public opinion needs to be balanced and the loudest voices aren't always the voice that will be best for our town. Um, and so that, that becomes really important to me. And I think the idea, I'd have to look at my notes right this second, the, the idea of balance, how do we balance these things? I know we all have different opinions on this committee and I unbalanced the other night and I apologize, Jen. Um, but um, that idea of balance, what can I give up? What can you give up for us to create something through consensus and collaboration, that's probably going to be better than either one of our um, limited ideas, our, our clasped ideas. So uh, that's kind of all I'm willing to say right this second. Uh, if you want more, if you want who I think my choices are right now, I can tell you that. But I want to know if that's what you want. I, I appreciate that you shared what you're considering, and maybe that's a good way to start. Great. Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in? Don't cough. So I won't cough. I put myself on mute when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I, 
I was going, I, I always like to go back to the selection guidance because we tend to vote that weeks, sometimes months before, before these interviews. Um, so we sometimes forget. And I, one of the things I'm thinking about is the, the board as a whole. Um, in some sense, it's fairly new. Um, but more interesting to me was when the planning board chair, uh, when we asked for their input, uh, summarized who the continuing members are. And what struck me as the continuing members are, there's really only one person who truly has a background in planning. Um, there's a couple landlords, but but the the chair said it consists of a sustainability advocate and fundraiser, a retired architect, and three interested citizens without relevant professional experience, but two of whom who have experience as landlords. And so I, I, I think one of my considerations right now is to make sure we don't end up with a board that has very little professional experience um, to the items that, that are being considered. Um, you know, we've over the last five years, I, I've been here making recommendations. We've put a lot of emphasis on lived experience and not needing that professional experience. But I, I worry that we're at a tipping point where we might go too far um, and not have enough professional experience. I think there's a balance between professional experience and not. Um, and so that, that's certainly one of the things I'm thinking of. Um, and then another thing is, you know, perspectives outside of Amherst, I've always been big on it. Um, not everyone has, but, but I'm, I, I always think that, um, experience living in similar or other towns, um, or cities similar or not is valuable to considering projects, especially on a planning board that also not just considers projects, but considers zoning. Um, because I think it brings a wealth of experience from uh, seeing different things in process. So that's another thing I'm looking at is, is that the, the having lived in other areas and experienced other areas, um, some of which might be similar to us. Oh, and one other thing, I, I agree with Pat on the public opinion um, that it it cannot be the only thing or be the thing that drives the, the decision making because it's just one part of a large thing. And it is only one small part of all of public opinion either anyway. Um, and so I'm looking at answers to that question seriously too. Uh -huh. Oh, did you call me? I couldn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I mean, as you know, I think public opinion is in, it's important that the public feels heard. I guess that's where I come from with public opinion. And I think that um, everyone, I think all the candidates seem like they really were very open to hearing the public. And that wouldn't be, that's never the only consideration. Even with um, East Gables, there was a lot of public opinion, but ultimately, I guess it was the ZBA or the planning board and the council. I wasn't on the council at the time, so I don't know if the council actually voted on that. Um, but that a decision was made, public comment was listened to, and then I think we would all agree the right decision was made. You know, and with the solar bylaw, we are going to take, you know, um, we will listen to the residents who are most, um, who are impacted by that. So I think, um, I didn't hear any of the candidates say that they, they all seem to understand all of them, the balance um, with public opinion that they would, the public would feel respected and heard, but that they would make the decision that was best for the, the town. But, you know, but again, the people that come out to the meetings, and this is, you know, I've listened in on a couple of the ZBA meetings with the solar bylaw, the people that are most directly impacted are obviously the people that are going to 
as Doug Marshall said, go to all that trouble to tune into a meeting. I think we really enjoy these interviews because they offer perspectives on how people think the boards and some of these other committees work. It's one thing to know what the name of the board is and what its charge is, but listening to people who are interested in, in some of that work, I, I find it really stimulating. Um, one of the things though that tends to happen is after a while, everyone begins to sound the same. And so whenever someone says something that is different, even if it is the wrong thing in quotes, that makes me have a pause. And um, I think that occurred for all the candidates. Someone mentioned that the board should pay attention to public opinion, but should be able to make unpopular decisions. That stood out for me. Um, I think someone mentioned being more lenient with regard to exceptions, and that also um, stood out. So perhaps what I would say is, I agree with all the candidates that everyone is qualified. I would prefer to give preference to those who have um, a bit more experience, but at the same time, leave opportunity for those who don't have as much to build as well. And maybe that might mean that um, someone in the middle doesn't get an opportunity, but I'm interested in seeing where the uh, rankings of the different candidates fall. I was I was thinking um, a little bit along the same lines of of what is the what is the experience because it is uh, it is a practical board it is a it is ninety percent of the work that's done by the planning board is sort of a project based visualization of what will be what will what will what will occur on a piece of property whether it's a, a housing development or whether it's a building um, or whether it's just adding a set of stairs to the back of a building that needs to get a permit. So it ranges greatly in complexity um, and, and um, visual impact, if you will, to the town. I like the idea of, of having um, a sense of, of applying policies or uh, applying standards in a in a regulated way um, but be aware of being aware of um, the opportunity to facilitate uh, certain aspects of a project and I think what I heard mentioned was um, affordable housing and I know we have a 40b process that that in fact helps facilitate, uh, development of affordable housing, so that that approach is is uh, you know an important factor. Um, I'll echo everyone else's comments about the the public input. Um, it it is certainly important, and it often brings it often brings perspectives that um, someone bringing a project or someone who might live distant to a project. Uh, it may just bring a different perspective on how to handle the situation that results in a better in a better product. Um, so again, it's it's welcome, should be welcomed, should be um, should be incorporated if if it doesn't strike um, the heart of of what the master plan is is intending. And we all know that the master plan is a little contradictory because I think as Doug mentioned at the very beginning, you you know we want we went we want theoretically dense downtowns or or town village centers but we also value the open space um, that Amherst brings so we 
kind of gone around a circle. Um, I would like to, I would like to, I think, um, have people recommend, uh, if, if you want to recommend someone that you feel of the three, um, is a primary candidate, uh, we could settle on perhaps a primary candidate and then talk in more, more length about, um, other, the others. Pat. I, I want to ask a question. I don't want to, um, are we really not voting tonight? Because I would love it if we could do that. And, but I thought I heard you say July 15th. So I'm no, no, we're voting, we're voting tonight on a recommendation. Council will not vote. Until the 15th. Gotcha. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Thank you. I would love to wrap up. Well, I'll start. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, no, let Councillor Ette, please. Okay, hey, Councillor Ette, please. I, I'm not st starting. I think I agree with your suggestion, Pam. Perhaps what we would do is maybe for now mention who the primary candidate is. So once that name is written down, we see how many those are and then um we can move on to the orders rather than have a ranking of one two and three if that makes sense we just start with one who the primary if pick a, is yeah if you, had a, if you had a top candidate who would it be if we go around and we understand who the top candidate might be for each of us um it'll sort out perhaps um, Councilor Haneke. So we we have potentially two recommendations to make. Um, I will say I I have two top candidates. Um, you know, and so I think it's a little of a false choice to say is there one when there are two openings. Um, so <laughs> That's a good point. Would you like to Would you like to state your top two candidates? Um, my. My top two are Doug and Lawrence. Okay. Um, Jennifer. Oh, yeah. I really don't like this, <laughs> but I know this is, really, you know, it just, um, just because we have strong candidates, uh, but we have to make a choice. So I was, um, I was impressed with um, Melissa's discussing as she really talked about the need for housing for, for many different kinds of housing and housing for across, you know, um, house, housing that's affordable and that she thought if there was a project, you know, came before the board that was especially for, you know, maybe uh, lower income residents or people that were able to get into the housing market for the first time that, you know, that would be something she might be more open to, you know, having a waiver, that that, that was part of what was motivating her to want to be on the um, planning board. And I, so I, Melissa would be one of, um, my choices. Uh, I was very impressed with Lawrence. And, you know, Doug Marshall certainly brings um, a strong skill set. He's an architect. He has experience on the planning board. Uh, it, you know, it wouldn't be any surprise to him. We tend to not, you know, always ag agree <laughs> on some of the um, the, the issues. I know that he, because I tune into a lot of planning board meetings, and he has made a, some statements where he has said that he feels like we're behind on providing housing for students, and that we really need to solve that, and that it may therefore be a while before we can really improve worker housing and middle income housing availability, because we have so many students with unmet needs. And that, 
I do, I mean, I don't, that's not um, the priority that I would give. I think that the university, I mean, we, of course we, I have students, many students who are neighbors, of course, students want to live off campus, will off, live off campus, should live off campus. But I don't think we, the town should be prioritizing their off-campus housing needs that will meet that need. And then we'll move on to worker and middle income Family, so I have some personally some policy um, points of disagreement on policy, but of course I respect him as a professional architect and someone who is very devoted to the town. So, um, so I, I would say Melissa and Lawrence, but I recognize this, you know, the strong skill set that. Um, Doug Marshall brings to the board. So I'm a little torn. I'm going to just say Melissa for now. Councilor Ette, do you want to weigh in? Pat was quick to the draw, so I'll defer to her and then weigh in. Wait, say, excuse me, say that again, please. Pat initially wanted to go first. And so I respect <laughs> that decision. <laughs> You're such a troublemaker. Um, why don't you go, Pam? Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the, the commentary about uh, professional experience uh, um, is, is still resounding with me. And I, I really appreciate the fact that Lawrence is um well versed in policy development and, and i think that certainly can be applied to uh opportunities on the planning board i was also um encouraged to hear melissa talk about uh architectural rendering which is not actually a, a minor thing um as i said before 90 90 percent of the work that comes to the planning board is often a drawing, a site plan, a an elevation of a building. What does it look like in real life? And um, I really appreciate the fact I I don't know I don't know if everyone on the current board can actually read a drawing. And I think it's a critical I think it's a critical uh, skill set for somebody being on the planning board. So I I would um, raise a voice for Melissa. And I would raise a voice for Doug. Um, he is asking for a renewal. Um, that's not the reason to necessarily grant it, but uh, there will be, um, at this count, there would be two architects on the board still. They're still missing a good landscape architect, but that won't get solved for a couple of years. You can't serve on the board when you're on the council. Right. Pat or uh, Councilor Ethi? I'm going next. <laughs> um, I frequently lock horns with Doug Marshall. <laughs> um, I find him, Doug, if you're out there, annoying often. <laughs> but I also find him to be a thoughtful chair. Um, I find him... Uh, really um, letting the public know who's in the room by announcing the other members of the committee who are there. And like Mandy, I am concerned about uh, the lack of experience on the current board. Um, while I like fresh eyes and things, but there needs to be some ground that's um, understood. And I feel like the, the planning board feels very divided on character. Um, so actually, Doug is my first choice. Um, but my second choice is for a very specific reason, and it's Lawrence. Um, and I, if I go back to his um, talk about special permits and waivers and stuff, he said some important things that felt important to me. Um, 
he he support he wanted if you know a project to support the master plan but um sometimes that bumps against the actual bylaw and so the and he talked about favoritism he talked about the bar should be high and what got me really interested is if a request is repeatedly granted to a certain kind of project or a certain um idea uh, then perhaps we need to then look at the bylaw. So there was a clear sense um, that the, that these two things uh, were deeply interconnected. Um, and I believe, I'm, I think he was the person who also talked about updating the master plan, which we were going to do every 10 years and we haven't. So I, and I'm, I'm very interested in the work and the ideas he could bring. So those are my two choices. Thank you. Let me help with Yeah. Um, it goes without saying, since I spoke of experience, that I would choose Doug. Um, there's something about continuity that matters, especially for roles like those in the planning board. Um, of the other two candidates, I was both impressed. I was impressed by both of them. I admired, as I said, um, Lawrence saying what didn't need to be said, which is that sometimes when you are in this kind of role, you will make unpopular decisions. That's something that didn't need to be said, and I really um, appreciate that. But I also am taking into consideration the fact that he is interested in serving the town in other ways as well. And I'm hoping that some of those opportunities might um, open up for him to be able to serve. And so I'm choosing Melissa for my second choice. I think what um, she mentioned about, um, that was question five, speaking about exceptions and how that might serve a broader economic demographic is something that resonated with me um, and stood out from what might end up just being a litany of um, answers to questions. And so my two choices are Doug and Melissa. Thanks very much. Um, Jennifer, so right now we have, I'll just, I'll just use the word vote, um, but we have four votes for Doug and three votes for Melissa and two for Lawrence. At this point, Jennifer has not suggested a second candidate that she would vote for. Um, I would vote for Lawrence, but I would, I'm not opposing anybody. I bet it's just. Okay, so at this point we have four, three and three. So I think um, if we can concur, it looks like Doug Marshall has um, the support of this group uh, to continue. Uh, and then we would talk about who would fill the second vacancy on the board. Is everyone in agreement with that? This is like ranked choice voting. Right. Any any disagreement with that approach? Um, okay. All right. So we will settle. We will settle on with Doug. Um, would anyone like to talk about? Um, well, we would. We I guess I would look at um, Mandy, who supported. Um, well, you, you've put in your support for Lawrence. 
Um, would anyone like to change their vote? Uh, Mandy. So at this, at this point, I'm not going to change, but um, I, I did not specifically state why I favored Lawrence over Melissa. Um, Lawrence and Doug over Melissa. Um, I was, Lawrence's answer to the public input question, he was the only one really that said um, that it was an important factor, it was a contributing factor, but he needed to base his decisions on sound policy and long-term considerations. And that that was a big thing to me, um, to be looking, you know, sort of one of the only candidates that said, we need to look at the bigger picture. Um, you know, in public opinion and public comment is very important, but the bigger picture is is what we're here for. Um, and the other thing that, that made me favor him uh, was his experience in Durham in another town gown city. Um, Durham, Duke, the research triangle has done a lot with housing, has done a lot with town gown relationships and dealing with student housing um, and housing in general um, that I think we could learn a lot from. And so his, his, you know, Melissa's lived in a lot of places. She, she, she said it right. Um, and that's great. And, and I know we've, we've benefited a lot from people who've lived in different places, but I think people who have lived in college towns, um, that are not Amherst, uh, bring a perspective that is absolutely necessary because it's not just an Amherst perspective. I know my perspective, having lived in Boulder for things that, and how I look at things um, has helped me a lot in, in dealing with and looking at and questioning and asking regarding our own issues with the university and being a college town. And so that was another important answer for why I favored Lawrence. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, yes, I'm not trying to take away from Nor from Lawrence the experience he brings having moved from another college town, but Durham is very different than Amherst. Durham has th almost 300,000 residents. Duke is as much smaller, has a much smaller footprint in Durham than the University of Massachusetts has in the very tiny town of Amherst. So I, yeah, they're college towns, but they're very different. And I think understanding um, the impact of a huge university in a, where the university population enrollment is almost double or significantly higher than the non-student population makes for a very different kind of town, different dynamic in Amherst than in a Durham, which is really um, a metropolitan a substantial metropolitan area. Um, Melissa did live for 20 years in Washington, D.C., which I know is not a college town, but has a lot of colleges, and she moved there to go to college. Um, so, you know, I, I, I thought, I think that Lawrence and Melissa are very good candidates. Um, I think that Melissa, having grown up here, um, having the experience, you know, she does have some experience reading architectural plans and she she brings that understanding, although she's not an architect. And I so I, I'm leaning a little towards Melissa over Lawrence. Um I think they'd both be great additions to the board. And I do think that public opinion can't drive the decision. And I don't actually think it does. I think that we do make decisions based on what's best for the town. And I've seen the planning board in the ZBA. I've seen the same um, members of the boards give a variance to one project one week and not to another the next week as they really look at, they, they and I think that, you know, Melissa and um, Lawrence, I mean, I think they look at the applications and they, they consider each on its own. And I've seen board members vote very differently on different projects um, that they don't come in doctrinaire. And I, I don't think that 
um, you know, either of these candidates would either. But I just wanted to respond to that point about Durham. So, so the result of all of your conversation is that you would, if we have a choice of two, you would favor Melissa at this point. I would, I think. I'm just trying to keep track. Pat. Hmm. Uh, Lawrence, is, of the two of them, Lawrence is my first choice. Um, I And nothing against Melissa, I really appreciated her energy and enthusiasm. Um, and I just had a, I just feel that, um, it feels very much like health and safety, sustainability. Those were issues that Lawrence was able to bring up. Um, and um, that that intrigued me. Uh, he's worked in higher education. He's worked in uh, politics. I'd love to know more about his work in national politics, but that's a separate agenda. Um, and he's done strategic planning. Uh, Melissa, brings a lot of collaborative experience um and it's and i i guess what i i feel the, the sense of moving consensus and collaboration forward to a single object uh in the instance of finding a way for an author and a design team to create the best format for a novel or or documentary or whatever where I feel the areas that Lawrence has talked about in terms of consensus and collaboration have been much more difficult um, because it, there is both the project that they that people have to look at, individuals on the board have to look at, but then there's also um, the health and safety of the residents, the drive of the master plan, the, you know, um, how do the how do, does this Bible of zoning uh, play out for all kinds of residents? Um, so, and I just I just feel like there's more uh, flexibility or something that I I I see in Lawrence. So that he's my choice of the two of them. He's my first choice. Yeah. Okay. I'm still choosing Melissa, but I, I'm looking at question four, where both Melissa and Lawrence really stressed the significance of families in Amherst. And I think that's something that we do need to keep um, emphasizing. Um, but that was a thread in the answers that she gave, not just on this question, but on some of the others. So I still um, think that Melissa would be my second choice. So it, let me make sure I understand. You you're still would put a vote for Melissa? I'm still sticking with Melissa, yes. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm the last to speak. Um, I am I am very torn. I think we have two wonderful candidates. I think um, they both they, they both bring um, some really wonderful and unique uh, considerations to the table. Uh, if I if I think about, um, I, I think distribution within the community is pretty equal. They both live downtown. Um, the the person the other person that was uh, whose term was ending is a woman there is uh, one other woman on the board right now and so this if if i keep my vote for melissa we would we would re retain at least that um that uh, distribution um and i oh uh, i i 
I mean, I would love to get them both involved in, in all kinds of committees <laughs> in town. Um, I'd like to see Melissa on the board. And again, I, um, well, for the, for the reasons I said before, I, I think it would round out um, at least um, um, I, think, I think Lawrence might be a little stronger thinking about master plan and updating and, and the, the ability to uh, sort of look at these big picture elements. Um, but I, I think I would I think I would stay with Melissa for my for my second choice. I mean, yeah, for my second choice. So by my count, um, I think we are slightly more in favor of Melissa uh, than Lawrence. If that is um, if that is a decision that we could take a vote on. Looks like we have three people voting for Melissa and two for Lawrence. Can we vote the two separately? Meaning, uh, can, we, can I make a motion for Doug and then we make a motion for the other one? Yep. yep. Um, I'll, I'll move to recommend Doug Marshall. The town council appoint Doug Marshall to the planning board for a term to begin immediately and ending June 30, 2027. Second. Thank you. Um, let's go around and vote. Uh, Pat. Aye. Jennifer. Can I abstain? Can you? Yeah. Um, uh, Councilor Ette. Aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. And Pam Rooney is an aye, so that is four four and one abstention. So we would we would recommend Doug Marshall. Someone want to make a motion. The next decision. Um, um, so I'll move to recommend Melissa Ferris for a position on the planning board. For term to begin immediately and end June 30, yeah, Is that how it goes? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Uh, is the term to begin immediately or because um, that would be July 15? Okay. It's immediately upon the council vote if they vote yeah. in favor. Right. Okay. Um, second. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go in order. Uh, Councilor Haneke? No. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? No. Uh, Councilor Ette? Aye. Dr. Taub? Yes. And Pam Rooney is a yes. That is three yes, two no. Uh, the motion passes, and we would recommend, I will write this up. Um, as the report to uh, the council, and we would um, proceed with that. Jennifer, you have your hand up. Uh, I'll let Councilor Haneke go first. Oh, I was just going to say I'm now going to leave the meeting. Um, Pam, just a reminder, I sent you my comments on nuisance if you guys get to nuisance tonight, so hopefully you can incorporate them into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bring that one up. Thank you, Mandy. Okay. Wait, I did want to say something then. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just you can tell by how I'm sort of stumbling. I, I'm I'm so uncomfortable um having to uh ev sort of evaluate people and vote. I just want to say I think you know they um Lawrence Clutes that because it doesn't reflect how I think his answers were um, terrific and thoughtful. And I really hope he will apply. He mentioned the Conservation Commission. I don't know if they have openings, but I he will be a wonderful um, asset to the town. I hope he applies for next opening on planning board or another um, opening on a town board or commission. 
Thank you. I totally agree. I totally agree. I'm going to go back to the agenda. It is now five minutes after eight, and we have two um, two folks uh, in the in the wings, um, Chief Ting and the Building Commissioner Mora. Let me read the agenda here if I can find it again. Uh, the next action item is for B, the nuisance bylaw, the continuation of the review by the governance organization and legislative committee with KT law uh, comments. Um, there is there is not going to be public comment unless someone would like it. Uh, and I'm going to look through the audience, um, but I think we will hold the public comment after we have our discussion on nuisance bylaw. Thank you, the two of you, for joining us. It went a little bit longer than I than I had hoped, but. So I am going to uh, try to share my screen. We are in the throes of the nuisance bylaw. We stopped at section G. If I can find it. Um, take a minute, sorry. I thought I had it all lined up. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I have, I have it up on my screen. I'm trying to find. Joe and you neither. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Can everyone see this? Ended up getting down to um I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll it a little smaller just because we have some comments on the sidebar. I just want to make sure we don't lose them. Um section G is notification uh, and nuisance property correction process. So this is where this is where we differ in this bylaw from uh, the current bylaw that doesn't really have it has notification, but it doesn't really have a corrective process. And the letters, uh, the the highlights in yellow, are those that um, were made in the previous meeting where we changed the word from uh, infraction to um, violation. Um, other than that, there was a there was a discussion and question about the posting and how we communicate our um, our notice with um, the property. And the the commentary which is here by posting the notice on the property, I think was an addition by either KP law or GOL in suggesting that there needs to be a physical piece of paper, sounds like, posted on the property. And I want to look at um, both Rob Moore or um, Chief Ting to ask if that is, in fact, the probable means of communication. We could include it, or we can include it and add the words, or by email or something of that nature. I'm looking at Rob now. So I, I didn't see that as a comment from KP Law. So I guess I'm not certain where it came from. Uh, I, I wouldn't feel that it's necessary, uh, but you know, it's. I think most of the 
uh, enforcement activity will be uh, handled by APD. So I, I think, you know, I would defer to Chief Ting if he has thoughts on that. So in in terms of a physical posting, I don't think I would recommend a physical posting on the property um, because you could never ensure that, that, you know, if we post it, how do we prove that we posted it if it disappears somehow? Well, the students can just take it and rip it down and say, yeah, well, we never got it. Um, if we do want to notify the property owners, um, we currently do that, but it's it's by voluntary basis only. So right now we have a list of landlords that um, that want to be notified if there's any type of violations of their of their uh, tenants. Um, but obviously this would encompass everyone. Um, I'm not opposed uh, to any method of notification. I just want to make sure that that it's clear that there was a notification made. Um, versus just posting it on the house. And I'm personally, I think uh, uh, an email would, would suffice. You know, email works best. That's, you have uh, a written documentation um, that's electronic and it's it's trackable. So we're just going to add that, and that would apply in all of these cases, um, posting the notice by email would be the preferred method. And I, Rob, do you have your hand up still? Oh, you don't. Okay. I mean, quick question for Rob. I guess, uh, you know, I would uh, I would assume under the rental registration that, you know, these landlords are, are going to be compliant for the most part, um, because if they ignore the email or or totally ignore the issue at, at all, then it, there will probably be consequences or at least uh, another conversation with them in regards to that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the items that my department would typically enforce, you know, have enforcement capability and other regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it really would only be used by us. This this particular bylaw would only be used if we were, uh, you know, combining certain violations that we're responsible for with other nuisance violations that APD might be dealing with to just mm -hmm. kind of further, you know, uh, deal with the matter and make sure everything's incorporated in the corrective action plan. Uh, so more for efficiency than anything else. I, I think I mentioned, uh, at one point prior that we typically, we, we probably wouldn't be using this as our first uh, option for enforcement unless it was, you know, in conjunction with something that APD was working on. I absolutely agree with that. Okay, so so can we also, um, the, the second part of this, so that, that a notice of violation will be delivered to all occupants by email um, and to property owners and persons in charge via certified mail. Is that again the the um, the preferred method of delivery? I think this was GOL that um, that suggested this. And perhaps uh, Councillor Ette, you're on GOL. If you recall, that was a, a preference of that group. I can't seem to recall. Okay. Yeah. So from from a notifying perspective, is certified mail the way you typically contact or it, would it, contact? It, it it isn't not certified mail. We usually just send a letter, but we can do it by certified mail to make sure that uh we have some tracking. I, I I'm gonna ask the same question. Is so does email is email not easy? Uh, official enough? I think it's official enough. As you know, as long as there's a response, then you can, like I said, you can clearly show that it was sent out. There's a time stamp, a date stamp, um, and if they reply to it, you have the same tracking method. So I would, I believe that suffices, and it's probably most efficient. 
so I'm, I'm looking here that perhaps on the first and second violations that if it's uh, uh, via email, that's, that's your, that's your first effort. And then on the third violation, uh, um, measured from the date of the first notice, notice of public violation and designation as a nuisance property. So this is the announcement that this is now considered a nuisance property. Perhaps mm -hmm. we say, um, we, we keep the certified mail uh, as a really, if, if that works, if that works as a, an even more official. Sure, manner. we could do that. And in many instances, we, al we also hand deliver. And we document that through our CAD system, through our dispatch. So service is made in hand. Uh, so that's an option as well. I wonder how we have, how closely we have to tie this down if we have multiple means. It would be good to be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, I guess but, I would defer that to, I mean, we have several options here. And I guess I would defer that to uh, the members here as to how they want that to be completed. Any counselor comment? I'm not hearing any any noise at all. Um, no, I I heard to the can. chief. <laughs> um, so, well, we could do it. We could do it via certified mail if, if for the sake of consistency. And I think uh, somebody made that suggestion. I don't know who made that suggestion, whether it was GOL or somebody else. Um, but for the sake of consistency and to make sure that we have a, a, a method of tracking it, we can we can go by certified mail. I'm fine with that. We're going to go with email, email. and certified mail because it's just you're going to notify everybody at the same time, and you can then add a certified mail to the to the owner of the property. Does that Sounds work? Good. That okay. works. Great. Um, down down below under two B, we're talking now about who to contact, and originally we had um, contact the town. So I, I want to clarify, um, in this case, we had inspection services or designee, and that was a manner in which to uh, either we, I, I want to hear from either Rob or Chief King, um, who takes the lead on this? I would say that depends on what the, viola what the violation is. Um, you know, it seems to me that this nuisance bylaw, the changes, uh, as Rob had mentioned earlier, it incorporates um, infractions both from the police and potentially from uh, inspection services. So I think that would depend on what the violation is. Rob, do you see, do you see so we could put, we could put, we could put it in a different order. We could say uh, Amherst Police Department or designee that is more consistently who would be uh, enforcing this? It, yeah, I mean, there, there's only two options. So, you know, if we're gonna say inspection services and APD instead of and designee, I think it's probably the same same amount of, of letters. Um, you know, the, the other option, which is more probably typically done is it just simply says the enforcement authority and we define that as being either inspection services or APD as applicable. Uh, you know, so I think either way, um, uh, you know, the KP law suggested replacing town with, you know, more specific uh, enforcement authority. But I think if we did that through a definition like we typically do in other bylaws, that would be OK as well. So I think the uh, the point that it's trying to be made here, though, is that um, we're trying to we're trying to set up a process where somebody violates and they get a notice. And I guess the notice would say who to contact, but if someone were to look at the bylaw, they would say, okay, it, it, it appears that this is, this is, um, or if a neighbor, if a neighbor is calling in, who, who is the, the entity at, in town that um, needs to know this? Hmm. Um. 
I think notification can go to the police department uh, because therefore, you know, we could be the, the clearing house for that. And if it's something that we decide that inspection services or another entity needs to enter in, uh, we can make that contact. Okay, so can we say APD or designee? No, I'm not opposed to that. Okay. So we would do the same thing here. It would be contact APD. Does that sound good for you, Rob? I mean, I mean, certainly if it's uh, if it's something where inspection services needs to get involved, like let's say Ed or something like that, we will we'll contact them anyways. Um, that's that's kind of how we've been doing things as as uh as a matter of practice. It, yeah, I, I think it's fine. I, I, I think because, you know, I feel like, you know, we're not gonna use it much. I think that's gonna be fine. It still is, you know, kind of awkward. Uh, you know, if somebody has a zoning violation under the, uh, you know, where we're, the bylaws telling them to contact APD uh, mm -hmm. first, it, you know, It'll eventually get to us. I know it will, but I think we do. All we did was just reverse the problem. So how do we clarify that? And I'm fine with either way if we clarify who to contact. I don't think it should be APD. I mean, I feel like yeah. I don't know. So we're talking. Let's let's go back to see. Um, this is strictly when it's a nuisance property, it's, it's gotten its second and third um, violation notice. Does It does include all of these zoning bylaws, general bylaws, junk vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I guess that's what we're saying, Pam. That's something, you know, so like the zoning bylaws are, are something that the police department would typically not handle. Uh, right. Okay, so going back, to, I'm sorry to be slow here, so going back to Rob's suggestion that it be the, the enforcing uh, entity, that's probably, that's probably appropriate because whoever's handling this particular case, is that, mm -hmm. is that where you're thinking? It's gonna be one or the other? That, that's what I was thinking, the applicable enforcement authority, and then, you know, somewhere in the definitions, we state who that is. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the zoning bylaw says enforcement uh, officer, and it says in definitions, that's the building commissioner. Right. Uh, it's pretty, pretty standard. I mean, I can talk, it was KP Law's suggestion, I can ask them if they have any better recommendation. Uh, but to me, that would work just fine. And be clearer to the to the user of the bylaw that you know it's one or the other depending on which law is being you know right. in violation. Yeah, and so we don't even need or designee. Okay. So maybe enforcement authority rather than enforcement officer. Enforcement authority. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I just have a question. If I can ask it, it, it is a noise um, complaint always a police department issue? Yes. Okay. Is it ever? That it seems kind of far, you know, the, intimidating, I guess, <laughs> for the police department maybe to be involved, but I guess that's who you call if there's. That's who's getting the call if you have a noise complaint. Is it ever press first? Or no. is that making things too complicated for you, Chief? It, it's at this point in time, it's never press. Um, that's been proposed. However, there's a lot of uh, obstacles with that. <laughs> okay. Well, I will stand by what you think is best. There.
So we are we are putting in the enforcement and authority, whoever that happens to be, and that will be on a case by case basis, I guess. Um, yeah, that makes if sense. They're, if they're if they're now we're now we're into the the uh, corrective action, and I think someone was looking for a definition of a correction a corrective action plan. That was pretty self explanatory to me. Um, we're going to correct. We're going to take corrective action. Um, at the meeting where this gets discussed again, it's uh, the would, would it would it be the police department that's actually meeting with landlords to um, hash out the, um, the corrective actions? We've never done that before. I mean, so this is all new in terms of. Uh... A corrective action plan. So I guess uh, I mean we can certainly be involved, but I guess that's up for discussion in terms of who the board wants uh, to be involved in that. Rob. So, inspection services doesn't have any enforcement authority with the current bylaw at all. So. I guess I wasn't at all expecting that we would be dealing with noise complaints or things that have uh, traditionally been handled by APD. So if if my thought was if there was only uh, those types of issues that are being worked on through the corrective action plan, that would be something that APD would be handling with the landlord uh, or the owner, uh, and we may not even be involved with it unless unless they brought us in for some reason. Yeah, no, that makes um, sense. You know, I think that's something Bill Laramie would handle. You know, certainly we're there mm -hmm. for support. There probably are other issues as well in those cases, and maybe we're doing it together. And you know, we're happy to whenever we're we need to be involved. We're happy to uh, you know take the lead on coordinating the meetings and and setting up the documents and doing all of that that we'll have templates for and be ready for. Uh, but I I still think it's going to be mostly APD. Uh, dealing with yeah. these responses. Can we use again, the words the enforcement authority again then? I'm sorry, Pam, I missed that last part that you said. If instead number four at that meeting the the uh, enforcement authority will provide the property owner the wording. I, I think that makes sense because again that again that's it's dependent on on the violation, you know, certainly if it's a noise complaint, I mean, we do have, uh, we've had meetings for corrective action plans, but it's been informal, you know, in speaking with landlords or potentially speaking with tenants, this kind of formalizes it and makes it a, a specific uh, action plan. Um, I So for like noise complaints, we would certainly handle it. But if it was like a, a parking issue uh, at a residential area where the cars yeah. are not parking according to the parking plan, then that wouldn't be us. So I think that enforcement authority would probably be best applicable. Okay, good. Um, correct me here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna once, once it is approved, the plan is approved by the enforcement authority, we'll just continue to use this word. Mm. Um, the the plan is binding. Failure to implement the corrective action plan is a separate violation, I believe, instead of infraction. And again, a separate violation. Mm -hmm. Sorry for typing and. Um, an owner may request the town remove the property designation if the property has not received notice of a violation in six months in the six months following the approval. This was intended to be an opportunity to lift the designation. Um, and I think I think Councillor Haneke had a comment about this. I'm going to scroll over. Um, Mm 
Uh, this was her question. Why was this added? If the town fails to send note, can you see this note? Yes. Okay. It says, Mandy, why was this added? If the town fails to send notice, but a ticket was written, the designation would be allowed to be removed because notice wasn't sent, even though it shouldn't, because original intention was violation keeps designation. I would reject this insertion. Um, I'm not sure I understand the issue. I think what E what E was trying to say is if nothing has happened at this property in six months, they're free to come back to you and say, hey, will you take off this this nuisance property designation? Um, maybe if we said an owner may request the town remove property designation, nuisance property designation if the property has not received additional violations in the six months. So I don't think the word notice of is necessary. It's just they have not received a violation. That's the intent. Does everybody agree with that? Just, I would just strike this word out. I think that's what Mandy was actually trying to say. Mm -hmm. So that they can request that we remove the designation if the property hasn't received a violation in the six months following. So then state law not preempted the second provision. I have my hand raised. I'm sorry. It's Pat, eight. Sorry. It's uh, eight thirty-two, and I have I apologize, but I have a hard stop, and it feels like this is a place we can pick up at our next meeting. Uh, it feels like we are at the very last two paragraphs, and okay, and okay, go ahead. The only thing I got about another five minutes. I apologize. Great, no uh, severability. There's a comment by Mandy as well on this. Let me see if I can. Get my pictures out of the way. Mandy's comment on severability. Are we sure we want it at the discretion of I can find the, the actual comment associated with this? Um, we have added it, and I guess the question is. Uh, it seems appropriate the provisions of this bylaw shall be deemed severable so that the invo invalidity of any one provision of the bylaw shall not affect the validity of another provision. And if any part of this bylaw shall be judged unconstitutional, inconsistent with state law, or otherwise invalid, such judgment shall not affect any other valid part of this bylaw. Do we agree with that addition to this? Pat, you have your hand up, and then Jennifer. Oh, my hand is, I'm sorry, I didn't lower it. Jennifer? Uh, my question actually is about the one above, so finish this, and then it wasn't about the severability clause. I'm, I'm, I think this is just a legal addition. I okay. don't have any issue with it. Yeah, uh, um, so I just want to clarify, a nuisance house designation um, is only for six months. Is that what that's saying above? I think that was E. Uh, I think it was saying if if after six months there are no additional violations, then the owner can come back and say, hey, I want to get this designation lifted. Okay, so we, we never had... So was that always kind of the policy that you have a oh, corrective action plan, you implement it, and then if there's no more violations or complaints for six months, you can request that it be lifted. So I guess that's my question is, does it have to be lifted 
I mean, wouldn't it have to be consistent for each request? Well, why wouldn't it be lifted if they haven't had any violation in six months? Yeah, no, I was just didn't for know anybody. Right, but is is that the time we're giving it? Could it be three months, nine months? I mean, what I didn't know. Um, I think the thinking about six months was that um, most leases are a year, and so if if infractions or violations occur at the beginning of a of a lease year. Um, I think you want it to hold long enough to keep a little pressure on so that you don't have recurrence of, of violations. Um, I guess my other question is if they were to forget to ask that it be, I mean, should it be hmm. more systematic? Uh, so that I don't like know. A it, you matter. know, it's like, if you don't remember to ask, then are you considered nuisance house for two years? It's just, I think the the although the although the designation is for the property, um, and this is maybe where it gets mucky. Um, it it actually follows those who are um, who are doing the violating. I, I see. Okay. No, it's not I'm, the police. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Chief Ting as I say that. It, it does get a little murky because if we're talking about. If it does it follow the house or does it follow the tenants? Right. And so part of the issue is, you know, which tenants, if there's four unrelated people, two of them move out and two remain. So how does that work? Right. And you know, and if they've if they've complied with the corrective action and if six months is the designated time period, then you know, at that point. You, you start from scratch again. You give them an opportunity. Um, right. So I guess what I'm saying is, do they have to ask you to remove it or pretty much after six months if there's no violation? That's up to you guys. I mean, <laughs> to decide. <laughs> uh, we, did, we did not actually discuss lifting. Rob? Uh, I'd suggest that that just remains at the discretion of the, the chief. You know, if it's solely a noise complaint, uh, having to do with the behavior of tenants that have moved out, he he can establish his policy on having those expire after a period of time, the signing of the lease, whatever, however they choose to manage it. I can tell you from plenty of experience that I'd want the designation to continue, you know, and not be lifted so quickly because it's, it's the responsiveness of the property owner and the things that they're doing in some cases that will decide if this property no longer carries that designation. And that could take longer than six months. It could take them five months to implement the, the corrective action plan, but not have an infraction. And you know, a month later they're asking to remove it. I'd say no. So I think I think that really has to be not defined so prescriptively. That's a great point, Rob. You know, we and and I think Jennifer knows this. We have certain houses uh in certain neighborhoods, you know, for example, Phillip Street, which are considered uh you know, secondary fraternity houses, and they they use the the rent uh, excuse me the the noise registration every single weekend, and um and a lot of times if it's a it's a fraternity even though the the turnover of the tenancy it still remains within that fraternity. So I like having that discretion um, to be able to say to take a look at it on a case by case basis to make that determination. Okay. If we if Thank we you. said Thank something you. if we said something like the owner may request the town remove the nuisance designation if the property has not um, has not received violations. Um, I mean, well, I guess it could be said I something guess, to to the effect of you know it's a request. So if it, if there's a request, then yeah. that means a, a conversation has to be had, or at at the very least an evaluation of what's happened uh, to make a determination if that can be lifted or not. And it says, it says may request following the approval of the uh, removal is at the discretion of the enforcement authority. So we, we leave it, we, we leave it okay. uh, with resolution yeah. to do that. Okay. okay. That's good. Great. Um, I, I, do people feel comfortable in, in, 
acknowledging the work that was done on this, that we have brought it to a different level and we are ready to vote on it? Or is this something that people want another month to think about because we will we will meet twice in in July? We certainly could work on this in July. Um, and I and what I could do is is provide everybody with a clean copy of all of the changes that we have agreed to in this document and give it to us clean. Um, I think I just made a decision. <laughs> I think we're not going to vote on it tonight. We're gonna we're gonna clean it up and we're gonna send it to you for the first meeting in in July, which is um, I think July nine. Somebody correct me. It's it's a it's a Tuesday night. I, I think correct? that sounds like a good idea, Pam. Okay, and now I can see because I just turned the light on. Thank you. Um, and I completely appreciate, I think I can speak for everybody. We really, really appreciate Rob and she going through this with us. It's, it's going to be dropped in your lap. You get to deal with it and it has to work for you. So thank you. Thank and, you. And uh, you'll, you'll see a cleaned up version. Sounds great. Um, I think you're free to go. I think we Okay, will... thank you. I apologize, but I've got to go. Yeah. Pat, thank you thank so you. much. And um, bye bye. We're going to just zip through the rest of the meeting. There are no announcements. Um, the next meeting will be uh, the, the topic will be nuisance bylaw with a clean version. And um, we will also, I think, perhaps have a presentation by, by the planning director for. Um, you drive and for um what's the other thing um oh, oh the uh downtown design standards design standards right right i um i guess we need to take a vote to you know can i i didn't have july 9th on my calendar is that just it could totally be my mistake but we do have a meeting um, Neither did I. Oh, you didn't? Oh. I think we don't have a meeting till July 26th. Oh. Wow. No, I'm sorry. I'm looking at, I'm sorry. July 23rd is what I have in my calendar. Okay. Maybe I put it on mine. Let me just see what I... I was trying to pull up. I have showed, some. showed the CRC on on July nine, um, and maybe it was out of habit that I just put the second and second and fourth. I guess we can go after the meeting. We can look at the calendar and. Yeah, uh, can we vote out of out of meeting to hold a meeting? I mean, can we can we send around a vote and and ask? Committee members, if they're willing to meet on the night, I think we can do that. Or are, do we have a quorum to, to suggest that we meet on the night? Um, we could do that. Yeah. It. Does that? We can um, always cancel it. Okay, so I will. Move. How about I make? Go ahead. No, you can make the motion. Um, I move that we that we hold a meeting of the CRC, a regular meeting of the CRC on July 9. Um, um, any seconds? Second. Let's take a vote. Um, okay. Councilor Essay, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I think it would be preferable to um, rather than having a vote to send an email to members of the committee asking about the availability on the night. Yeah. Yeah. Rather rather than us taking a vote. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Guess it, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay, I'll send an email out if that's feasible for everybody. Thank you. Okay, that said, um, um, let's. We don't I, have to I'm vote, do we? No. We we 
we were told that we probably should, but I think it's silly. Anyway, I'm going to do it. So I move that we adjourn the meeting. Uh, no, no, I just meant we didn't have to vote on sending the email around. Oh, no. Oh, okay. We do have to vote to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> okay, I'm an aye. <laughs> Jennifer. Yes. Councilor Ette. Was there a second? Yes, there, uh, no, there was not a second. But you can second it and vote. Okay, so <laughs> I second and I. Thank you. All in favor. Chief Ting, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank night, you. Everybody. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night.